note that this content is for adults only. Viewer discretion advised. If you haven't yet, hit the subscribe, like and share. Hello everyone and welcome back to another live stream with me, Gisela K. This is Grizzly True Crime and today we are talking again about the Delphi case. If this is your first time ever hearing about the Delphi case, don't worry, there's a whole playlist for you to catch up. We've done presentation time, deep dives, map time, so many documents, oh my word, and you could watch it at 1.25 or 1.5 or I challenge you to two times speed and you can get caught up real quick. <laughs> Welcome to all the moderators that can be here right now. Oh my goodness, thank you so much. I know it was last minute notice and happy Thanksgiving to everyone, especially if you're celebrating in the USA. That's generally where you celebrate it, right? <laughs> so happy Thanksgiving to you. I did say I'd see you tomorrow, but here I am again. And if you saw the short that I posted on my second channel, Grizzly True Crime Shorts, I told you I was stuck, okay, in armchair because I had the cutest kitty that came to sit next to me for the first time. <laughs> that would be Willow, our new cat. She was just like, ah, okay, I'm just going to sit here with this lady while she makes a whole lot of YouTube shorts for the Grizzlies. And I couldn't move. And now I'm happy because, you know, lipstick is still on. I'm ready to go. Okay, I'm ready to talk about these updates with you. There's three documents we're quickly going to look at, but I just want to give you this little article update and show you, of course, mugshot time. It's mugshot time. <laughs> Welcome to all my mods, patrons, members, everyone, all the Grizzlies. Really appreciate you all being here again. Please like and share so that in case others miss it, because they're probably going to miss it because it's Thanksgiving, you know, um, let them know that we were actually live. Then maybe they could watch the replay. Stephanie, you said you are so hardworking. Thank you for all you do to keep us updated. Thank you so much. And thank you for being a member for seven months. I hope that my mic is okay. I really boosted my own mic today before this live stream. I'm like, I'm tired of this mic and Bill Gates messing with me. So let's look at this um, update here. This is a picture of Mitch Westerman, which I think you've, you may have heard his name before because Richard Allen, the suspect in the Delphi double homicide case, his former attorneys, Bradley Rosie and Andrew Baldwin, right? Andrew Baldwin has said in documents that there was this former, like a friend and a former associate that actually went into his office, took pictures of the crime scene photos and then disseminated them. And there were three disseminators. One of them, this is the, this is apparently the original leaker. And the photos were then, we're going to go over exactly what they say in the affidavit as well. There's a probable cause affidavit for this. So there's new documents that just came out. And so basically, the, he's facing consequences. We're going to get to that. Okay, but this guy is facing consequences now, which I was wondering about. Would he face consequences? I mean, isn't there something that's wrong about doing that? You know, the attorneys got thrown off the case and all of that. So, hmm, let's have a look. Okay, so also one person, one of the three disseminators took their own life. So that is extremely sad. There's been a lot of consequences with this leak. Even though we know that photos had leaked before, this is still two wrongs do not make it right. <laughs> even if photos leaked before, way back in the past, over the years, and they've said that, even in those transcripts we looked at, this is wrong. Okay, so uh, thank you, St. Abby, for being a member for 20 months. Oh my goodness. So it says, Johnson County, a Westfield man has been charged in Johnson County for his role in leaking crime scene photos from the Delphi murders. Mitch Thomas Westerman, 41, is charged with conversion, and I'm going to show you what that means, a Class A misdemeanor. The charge filed in Johnson County Superior Court 3 was unsealed on Wednesday. Bartholomew County Prosecutor Lindsay Holden Kay is the special prosecutor in the case and will handle prosecution of the case in Johnson County. Both the 2017 murders of 13-year-old Abigail Williams and 14-year-old Liberty German, last year's arrest of suspect Richard Allen, 51 of Delphi, and his criminal case have been subject to intense media coverage in both Indiana and across the nation. The crime scene photo leak has, been, has received similar scrutiny. And the judge's <laughs> actions too. Okay, 
So yeah, they're giving an overview of the Delphi case. We've obviously done a deep dive on this channel, so I'm sure most of you are aware of it, right? And we're going to go over the documents which will tell us all about this, okay? I just wanted to give you a quick overview. Then what he was charged with was actually conversion, which I then looked up, what is that? And this is according to casetext.com, Indiana Criminal Code, conversion. A person who knowingly or intentionally exerts unauthorized control over property of another person commits criminal conversion, a class A misdemeanor. So that is what it was. This is what he's been charged with. Okay. So I don't know why exactly it's that and why it's not a theft charge. I think it was a little tricky to know like what, what do they um, charge him with? Gene says, why would he leak sealed photos of a brutal crime scene? I also asked myself why, and interestingly enough, this guy, I just find it like the timing is interesting to me. I'm not trying to put a theory out there, okay? But he was interviewed by a podcast called The Murder Sheet Podcast in March of 2023. So I don't know if he got ideas in his head after that for some reason, because even in that interview, he kind of threw Andrew Baldwin under the bus. And if you've never listened to it, you can check it out on The Murder Sheet Podcast. And so, um, I'm not generally trying to promote, <laughs> I'm just saying it is out there, okay? It is out there. And so, we're, we're going to go over it now. Let's just get to the document and then we can go over it. I just find it interesting that he was interviewed in March of 2023. And in this probable cause affidavit, he says that he distributed the photos months ago. Months ago. And I'm like... Okay, so when did you get the idea and why did you get the idea? I also want to know why. Why? Why did he do that? The initial speculation was that the leakers did it in order to help prove the defense team's point with the Odin angle. But I don't know about that now. I'm not sure. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> Ronnie, uh, for missing persons, P&W says, I kind of feel like people paid him. I'm wondering. I just don't know. I don't know what the motive would be. I think that would be very interesting. And yeah, in many cases, follow the money or the Google searches and you're going to find out a lot, right? All right. So by the way, if you missed my earlier live stream, please do check it out. Okay. Maybe you didn't see that notification. So let's go to the documents now. First, I have to show you this one. Then I'm going to show you the probable cause of the leaker. This is a one pager. And <laughs> in my title today, it says the Supreme Court, okay, responds to Richard Allen. And it says, in the Indiana Supreme Court. Am I right this time? <laughs> they said something here, and I find this very interesting. So they said, State of Indiana, X rail Richard Allen, Relator versus Carroll, Circuit Court et al. Respondents. This is a Supreme Court case, okay? They say, Order. On October 30th of 2023, the Relator, Richard Allen, by counsel, uh, petitioned for a writ of mandamus and prohibition seeking relief under the rules of procedure for original actions. On November 16th of 2023, respondents by counsel filed a brief in oppos in oh, sorry, filed a brief opposing the petition. The relator has moved to file a brief replying to the respondent's brief. We read through that yesterday. The one with the chart, the grading of the papers. Okay, I think that's what it was. <laughs> Although the rules of procedure, this is interesting. Although the rules of procedure for original actions do not afford a relator the right to file a reply after the respondents have opposed issuance of a writ, the court retains the authority to permit deviation from the rules and chooses to do so here. Am I reading this right? Are they literally saying, you know what, we know this is not standard practice, but we're allowing it. We are allowing whatever they filed yesterday that we read through, the grading of the paper, this fine. That's what they say. They tell me if I'm interpreting it wrong, okay? That's, I've read it a few times and I'm like, okay, okay, I think it. Papa Bear said, gee, you don't miss a thing. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here. So one more time, they said, although the rules of procedure for original actions do not afford a relator the right to file a reply after Judge Gull have opposed the issuance of a writ, the court retains the authority to permit deviation from the rules and chooses to do so here. Being duly advised, the court grants the relator's motion for leave to respond to the respondent's objections. The clerk is instructed to file the relator's response to the respondent's objections as of the date of this order. That's what we read through yesterday. See, there was a big deal. 
I knew it. Okay. <laughs> Michelle Color says things are getting crazy. Hugs to Willow and Fury. Thank you so much. Really, really appreciate it. Oh no, back the blue. You said this makes me think of the YouTuber that sold autopsy pics of Latisha steps out. It's terrible. I don't understand why. I don't know where. Like people get lost in the world of, I don't know if it's like trying to be, I don't know, relevant or viral or something that you just think, oh, cool. I've got like crab scene pictures. No, man. No, man. As I say, somebody's emailed me for over a year already and saying, I've got them. I've got crime scene photos. You want them? You want them? No, I don't want them. I don't want them. <sighs> anyway. And so let's have a look at this. Oh, yeah. And then I'm going to read you this. All right. Okay. 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 So this is now uh, relating to Mitch Westerman, who was just arrested for leaking the photos. Okay. All right. <laughs> Hope and Vera says, G does not miss a trick in the Netherlands. Like not miss a beat. Is that what it means? <laughs> All right. So appearance form criminal case number 41 name of defendant Mitchell Thomas Westerman case type of proceeding criminal misdemeanor. Okay, so let's just skip to where that probable cause is. Rest warrant, yes, we want to go down to this one. I'm like, what kind of redaction is that? State of Indiana versus Mitchell Thomas Westerman. The undersigned affiant being duly sworn upon his oath says that she's informed and verily believes that between August 1st, or August 1st, the timeline's getting interesting. You know, with Nicholas McClellan saying he knew about it for 17 days and was working on a day and night, which took us to October 2nd. So let's see. Between August 1st, 2023, oh, and October 5th, 2023, in Johnson County, the state of Indiana, Mitchell Thomas Westerman did knowingly or intentionally exert unauthorized control over the property of Andrew Baldwin to wit images, all of which is contrary to the laws of the state of Indiana. I affirm under the penalties of perjury as specified in IC 3544 1-2-1 that the foregoing representations are true. C. Cheney says, would this arrest not make Baldwin a victim of his crime? And does that change his situation? Thoughts. I think he's still ultimately, thank you, C. Cheney. I think he's still ultimately responsible. He should have had all those photos like really on lockdown, like he said he would afterwards. He said he'll correct his actions and make sure not for a second can anyone see it. It should have always been that way. And there's allegations out there that Baldwin may have been sharing defense strategies with him. I haven't heard that anywhere else but that podcast I mentioned earlier. So don't know where that information is from. <laughs> okay. Jill says, gee, never sleeps. She's on the case. I'm blaming the cats tonight. Go check out my second channel after this, Grizzly True Crime Shorts, and you'll see my latest one with the cats that were in the office. And that's why I was still here. <laughs> okay. So uh, Angie Bienemann says, love you and the Grizzly fam. Uh, I'm glad Willow let you off the chair. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. Now, here we go. We love a probable cause that for David. All right. Tomorrow you're going to get another one in a premiere. Happy Thanksgiving. <laughs> so that will be for Donna Adelson. Okay. All right. So here we go. State of Indiana versus Mitchell Westerman. Affidavit of probable cause. I, Benjamin Rector, being duly sworn upon oath states that I'm employed. Okay. So this is like, let's just read it. Let's just read it. I'm like, you know, when they qualify what the, who and what they are. I'm employed as a law enforcement officer with the Indiana State Police. My current assignment is a detective in the Criminal Investigations Division. Law enforcement was advised that on or about October 5th, 2023, that evidence from the murder case of the state of Indiana versus Richard Allen had been released to the public. Hmm. But if we go through the timeline, McClellan knew about it on October 2nd and didn't tell law enforcement. I'm just saying. Very interesting. Okay, so there's currently an order. Uh, there's currently an order from the court in that case prohibiting release of evidence to the public. Law enforcement was made aware that this evidence may have been obtained illegally and began an investigation. Law enforcement was able to retrieve the evidence from the creators of a podcast. One more time. Law enforcement was able to retrieve the evidence from the creators of a podcast who stated that they got the evidence from an individual in Texas. Indiana State Police First Sergeant Jerry Holman was able to identify the individual in Texas as Mark Robert Cohen. Mark Cohen was interviewed and law enforcement obtained screenshots of messages between Mark Cohen and an individual named, I'm going to say RF out of respect for him. He took his own life. We don't know why. We don't know the circumstances, but he took his own life. Okay. RF and Mark Cohen have 
various discussions about various pieces of evidence involved in the Richard Allen case. Also, might I add, it's Abby and Libby's case, right? <laughs> Someone's going to correct me. I know they're going to be like, listen, now it's in the next phase. Now it's Richard Allen's case. But I always feel like, oh, man, it's their case. It's the fight for their justice, for Libby and Abby. Okay. I, Indiana State Police Detective Ben Rector, was assigned to assist in the investigation. As part of the investigation, the Affian completed interviews with attorneys Brad Rosie and Andrew Baldwin on October 12th of 2023. I'm just memorizing dates, okay, because I remember Richard Allen writing a letter to the judge on October 11th saying that he's aware of the leak and he doesn't want his attorneys to be thrown off the case. So keeping this all in mind, are the dots connecting? Yes, thank you, Pernille Justice for Libby and Abby. And thank you, Grizzly Cat, for sending me these documents. I love documents. Okay, so the, uh, the interviews, October 12, 2023, concerning the evidence that was taken without consent in regards to the representation of Richard Allen. The Affian previously knew that Rosie and Baldwin were attorneys which were assigned to represent Richard Allen in his criminal charges. During the course of the interview with Andrew Baldwin, Detective Rector learned that Baldwin is an associate of Mitchell Westerman. Baldwin has known Westerman for several years and Westerman was previously employed by Baldwin's law firm. But, as far as I understand, Mitch Westerman is not an attorney. I don't know in what capacity he was employed, but uh, as I say in that interview with the podcast, yeah, man, he threw his buddy under the bus. He is not a friend. So that much is clear. Anyway, so Baldwin has known Westerman for several years and Westerman was previously employed by Baldwin's law firm. Westerman is no longer employed by the law firm. However, he still routinely stops by the firm to visit with staff and Baldwin. <laughs> I love it when people get excited. Yes, I caught this one. Aisigul Aksu, thank you for being here. You're like, yes, I caught this one. Thank you for being here live with us. On Monday, now here we go. On Monday... October 9th, 2023, Westerman contacted Baldwin around 4 p.m. and requested to meet with him. It sounds kind of like we need to talk, which is also weird to leak the photos, but then contact your friend who you're not really a friend to. You'll just stab him right in the back and then be like, hey, I need to tell you something, bro. You know, it's, it's a little odd. Okay, I still, I don't know, the story's still quite sus. What was Mitch Westerman thinking? Yes, who paid him? Why did he do it? You know what I mean? It's many questions. Thank you, 93 Films and Media. On October 9th, so Westerman contacted Baldwin around 4 p.m. requested to meet with him. They met at Baldwin's office shortly afterwards. Westerman told Baldwin that he had used his cellular phone to take photographs of photographs, which were in Baldwin's conference room area. The photographs depicted the crime scene related to the criminal charges against Richard Allen. Westerman stated that he had done this a couple... This is a very important sentence to me. Uh, let's highlight it. <laughs> Westerman stated that he had done this a couple of months prior and that he had shared them with an individual named R.F. That's the guy who took his own life. Through the course of the investigation, law enforcement learned that R.F. shared these photos with another individual in Texas, Mark Cohen. Cohen then shared them with various creators of YouTube channels and podcasts. Okay, so that makes sense as well because, and I'm not understanding why the podcast, the Murder Sheet podcast was kind of saying that it was Delphi After Dark and them, the only ones that knew about it, but I'm just, it just sounds like there's a lot more. It sounds like this Mark Cohen dude leaked it to a lot more people. You know what I mean? So much to think about. My goodness, my mind. <laughs> I'm just like, what? So Cohen then shared them with various creators of YouTube channels and podcasts. Because the more I go down the rabbit hole, the more I look, there's more and more podcasters and YouTubers saying, I got the photos. I got the photos. Yeah. And I'm like, wait, what? Like, how many of you all got the photos? Are they all just saying it? Which again, it's not cool to have the photos. It's not something to possess or have or to be relevant with. My word. Okay. Baldwin stated that based on the timing of events, he believed that there were in fact crime scene photos from the Richard Allen case in the conference room when Westerman visited his office. Which is also interesting because he's got to think back a couple of months back and be like, 
Oh, crap. When he was here a couple of months ago, whenever that may be. Whoa, like there were photos in the conference room. Okay. So that's interesting. And again, I say it's still interesting to me that he was interviewed by a podcast in March of 2023. Never mind. Moving on. <laughs> we'll figure it all out eventually. So Baldwin stated, based on the timing of events, he believed there were, in fact, crime scene photos from the Richard Allen case in the conference room when Westerman visited his office. He also stated they would have liked, uh, they would have been side-by-side -side photographs which were previously used by the defense team in depositions. The photographs that Baldwin described are consistent with photographs that Affiant has viewed which were released of the crime scene. Baldwin stated that he did not authorize Westerman to take these photographs. During an interview with Rosie, he also indicated that he did not authorize Westerman to take photographs. Rosie further concluded that he believed that Westerman's taking of the photographs constituted theft because he did not believe that anyone had authorized Westerman to take the photographs. An affidavit was also provided to Allen County Judge Gull, which states the following. And we read through that before, right? Jean says, how would they like it if it was their child? I know, right? Well, I think a lot of those ones, I mean, I don't have children. I'm just saying. I think a lot of these that are kind of bragging about having it, I don't know if they have kids. If they do, I can't imagine. Like, how is it like, how is it a cool thing to have? It isn't. It isn't. That's right. Forensic Fury says, why would you even want these photos? Morbid curiosity got wild online. Yes. Okay. And so, let's make it bigger for you. Sorry about that. Is that better? All right, so an affidavit was provided to Judge Gold, which states, Comes now Mitchell Westerman being first duly sworn under oath and states that the following information is within his personal knowledge and is true to the best of his knowledge. One, I was in attorney Andrew Baldwin's office building waiting to visit with Andrew. He was in his office either meeting with a client or on a telephone call with the door closed. I went to the conference room to wait. I ob two, I observed printed copies of photo evidence on the conference room table. I took pictures of a few of them. Andrew Baldwin did not give me permission to take the photos of the printed copies. He was not present and he did not have any knowledge that I took pictures of the evidence photos. 4. I am freely and voluntarily typing and signing this affidavit on my own accord because it is the truth. This document indicates it was signed on October 18th, 2023 by Mitchell Westerman and was also notarized. Which was before the October 19th hearing where Judge Gall told the defense you either withdraw now <laughs> or... I'm going to read a statement in front of all these people here. Interesting, the day before they got this affidavit, okay. Affian further believes that the above-mentioned facts establish probable cause to believe that Mitchell Westerman has committed the act of conversion, Indiana Code 3543-4-3. Renee Hatton says, I would have nightmares forever. In the Letitia Stout case, I was one of four people that requested the FOIA file because I wanted... Letitia Stauff's interrogation, uh, interviews, and things like that. And we've gone over that before, but oh man, in that file, it wasn't all labeled properly, and people say I'm just too sensitive, but to me, I got a huge freaking fright because the files weren't labeled properly. There was no like trigger warning or something. You just didn't know what was in the folders. And some of those crime scene photos that I saw, some of the, well, the autopsy photos and things, mm -mm. you don't want to see it. You don't want to ever, ever. Oh man, it's just... I'll never unsee it. I can't imagine what all these people have seen. And I can't imagine thinking, ooh, let me just quickly take a picture of it and then share it. And then the risk of that just getting out there. Oh, and it, the risk existed and it went out there. It could ruin the case. Even though they say, well, it would be things that would be shown at trial and everything. It's terribly disrespectful to the victims. I oh, thank you, Jean Davis. <laughs> Wisdom Slew says no one has tried to explain how a 2 a.m. phone is pinging and a 2.13 a.m. scream yet they think the girls were killed in the middle of the afternoon with some five foot four dude with a park full of people yeah Wisdom Slew <laughs> I know what you think I get it I'm just like wait what believe me those types of questions keep me up at night <laughs> okay so we've gone through that and then let's go here order sealing arrest warrants and charging information is confidential Comes now the state of Indiana on its motion to keep arrest warrants and charging information confidential. The court finds after being duly advised, finds the same shall be granted. All right. 
order determining probable cause and request for a warrant. And so here they say what? It is therefore determined by the court that probable cause exists for the bringing of the charges alleged in the information in the above titled cause of action. The court now orders the clerk of this court to issue a warrant for the arrest in the above named defendant and hereby sets a bond on the defendant in the sum of $1,000 of surety and $250 cash only. So he's probably going to get out today. He's probably watching the stream. <laughs> you know, like, okay. Imagine if he doesn't get out today. Don't do that again, dude. Don't ever do that. Oh, man. So let's see what happens next, right? I think those are, that's all of it. Motion to unseal arrest warrant. Okay, so they did that as well. Unsealed the arrest warrant and signed. Now let's quickly look at this. This is what I was talking about the other day, but then there's just so much to read. This is the record of proceedings, the 246 page document that was included in one of the 118 documents that is on the Allen Superior Court site. That one link that Judge Gall made, instead of putting it on the court system, the CCS, there's a link, there's a zip file, there's documents. In those documents, I looked at every single one. This one is a big one, 246 pages. And there's lots of interesting little things in here. And this is more about the leak. So I thought we could read through this. This is perfect timing then. <laughs> Lisa says, Grizzly, isn't it like 12, 30 a.m. where you are? Yes. And we know that only, <laughs> only Sunny Slaughter can tell me to go to sleep. And believe me, she will. If she says I'm live right now, she'll be like, you, 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 you go to bed. <laughs> if you don't know who Sunny Slaughter is, check out my playlist. Uh, she's been on the show before. She's also on X, Sunny Slaughter. And she also features regularly on Court TV and Scripps News and all over the place, right? Ooh, sorry, I missed, a, I missed one there. Hold on. Raptor Man 48 says, For all we know, Westerman is covering up, covering up for his friend Baldwin. I mean, I don't know. All right. So, um, JJ, we don't celebrate Thanksgiving in South Africa or the Netherlands. Remember, I'm proudly South African, even though I live in the Netherlands. I live here because my husband got a job here, okay? I love South Africa. Moving on. Dear Judge Gall, look at this. Let's just see when this was. October 12th of 2023. Let's read through this one. Dear Judge Gull. And this is from the defense. Wait, <laughs> I just want to make sure. This is from Bradley Rosie, I believe. Ex parte pleading to be placed under a seal. But here it is. In the wake of the recent circumstances surrounding the distribution of crime scene photos, in this case, Andrew and I thought it appropriate. Yeah, Bradley Rosie, right? Um... <laughs> Andrew and I thought it appropriate to communicate to the court in writing our version of the events and general thoughts regarding Nick's comments, as Nick McLillan, the prosecutor, that he believed disqualification may be the appropriate remedy here. Naturally, those are strong words and warrant some response from the defense. Therefore, we thought it appropriate to provide some context regarding what has occurred here and what circumstances arising therefrom. Our thoughts are as follows. They say, one, facts. Andy has offices in three separate locations, but I like this because of some background info, you know? Okay, so Andy, Andrew Baldwin, has offices in three separate locations, but primarily works out of his Franklin office. In the far back of his office building, Andy has a personal office, which sits next to his conference room. Throughout this case, we, the defense, has utilized the conference room as our home base in terms of storing diagrams, photographs, and other exhibits that are involved in this case. We've also used the conference room for our defense team meetings and to generally review discovery. This includes searching through the 20 or more hard drives that we've been provided by the state, various thumb drives and other discovery documentation. I would estimate that 90% of the discovery and related materials in this case are generally located in Andy's office. Andy has a friend by the name of which, uh, which Mitch Westerman. <laughs> Tongue twist if you say it too fast. All right. Andy has a friend by the name of Mitch Westerman. Mitch has a, a law degree, okay, but he's not a practicing lawyer from what I understand. Let's see. He's got a law degree from Valparaiso, is that correct? And at one point in the past worked as an employee at Andy's firm. Mitch is also Andy's personal friend. <laughs> not anymore, or is he? <laughs> it is my understanding that Mitch had a girlfriend in the Franklin area and therefore would routinely stop by the office when he visited his girlfriend. Andy communicated to me that Mitch was a fairly skilled strategist and that he would sometimes, oh, there you go, communicate ideas and circumstances with Mitch to get his feedback. 
Andy reported, this is where it comes from. Okay, fine, fine, fine. We read it now. Here it is. Okay, I'm like, where does it come from? There you go. Andy reported that he did this on occasion in this case. Well, you see, that's wrong. <laughs> Don't you think? Don't you think it's wrong for him to discuss strategies for the defense with Mitch Wester with Mitch Westermer? That's wrong. In my opinion, I think that's wrong. It might not it might be so obviously wrong that you're gonna be like, duh. <laughs> Don't discuss your defense strategies with your friend or what? All right then. So then they say Andy reported that he did this on occasion in this case. At no time did Andy ever authorize Mitch to duplicate or take phys physical possession of any exhibits or documentation in this case. So Andy clearly trusted Mitch a lot. But why did Mitch then break that trust? What motivated him to break that trust? What was the driving force to take those pictures and share that with RF who then shared it with Mark Cohen who then shared it with YouTubers and podcasts? What was that about? I would love to know. Because if you have the trust of Andrew Baldwin, who's working as the defense on the highest profile case in Delphi, why would you break that trust? Why would you do that to your friend or what? <laughs> Joanna, I love it when you always remind me. You're allowed your opinions, G. <laughs> Joanna always reminds me. Thank you so much. It is true. I don't grow up being allowed opinions, right? So it's been a while to develop my voice and actually and actually share some thoughts. <laughs> so thank you so much. It really means a lot to me, Joanna. All right. Book Girl says, I thought the crime scene photo leaker took his life. So Mitch Westerman took photos of photos in Andy Baldwin's conference room. Then Mitch Westerman leaked that. He gave that, that some of those photos to a guy called RF. RF took his own life. RF, before he took his own life, had passed those photos on to another guy called Mark Cohen. Mark Cohen distributed the photos to YouTubers and podcasters. So there were three disseminators. Mitch Westerman, RF, who took his own life, Mark Cohen. And then it went all over the place. All right, so during the week of October 2nd, the defense became aware of a gentleman in Texas who claimed that crime scene photos had been leaked and that Andy was the party who leaked the photos. Naturally, this called for some immediate disclosure. Andy and I discussed the matter and believed that it was important to communicate our concerns with the prosecutor and the court. This disclosure was accomplished uh, through the emails you received from us last week. TC says, if the gentleman in question was arrested, how is it not grounds for removal? Are you talking about the defense attorneys? It can be. Remember, I've never argued that it's not grounds for removal for this defense team. I just think it's unfortunate that the judge didn't go the right way about doing that. Follow the procedure, remove them properly, let them have a hearing. There needs to be, I think it's called an evidentiary hearing. For all the findings that Judge Gall said she made, you need to do the proper thing. Okay, there's a procedure to this. You can't just say, kind of like, because I said so, or let's just protect your egos, and you just go out of here, and I'll take it from here. It's not about that. you got to follow the procedure. Okay, so on Monday, October 9th, yes, Mitch Westerman showed up at Andy's office and asked for a few minutes of Andy's time. Andy reports that during the conversation, Mitch acknowledged that he had made a mistake and, in fact, took it upon himself to access Andy's conference room and photograph some exhibits that he discovered laying on the table. We believe this occurred back in August, when we were preparing for the first round of depositions. In fact, Nick later confirmed that they, the prosecution, believes that the docs possessed by Westerman are the same or similar to the exhibits that were offered up by us, using, us during depositions. Westerman then reported to Andy that he shared these images with his military friend, who is not associated with the defense in any manner. This man then apparently distributed them to a man in Texas. The man in Texas is the same individual that was accusing Andy of intentionally leaking these documents. Mitch Westerman then apologized to Andy for what he had done and indicated that he would do whatever was necessary to make things right, including talking to the police. This conversation between Andy and Mitch Westerman occurred at around 4 p.m. on Monday, October 9th. At 4.48 p.m., Andy shared with me what had occurred at his office in Franklin via email. I did not see the email until the morning of October 10th as I attended a school board meeting on Monday afternoon at 5 p.m. and thereafter spent some time with my kids. 
The next morning, Tuesday, October 10th, while at work, I discovered the email. That must have been a shocker. You know, I hope he had his coffee first. <laughs> She's like, open inbox. Like, wait, what? Wow. Which we can understand then why Bradley Rosie was like, can I stay on the case? If Andy has to go, can I stay on the case? Different offices, right? All right. And so uh, I discovered the email. I then immediately communicated with Andy. We agreed that we needed to disclose these facts to Nick immediately, which we did. This occurred by way of a phone call with Nick just minutes before we spoke with you yesterday afternoon. Remember, this is a letter to Judge Gall. As a follow-up matter, we have tried to encourage Mr. Westerman to make himself available to the police for questioning either alone or through a lawyer. We've learned that he has sought out legal representation. We spoke with his attorney, who refrained from any substantive comment regarding the matter. The same attorney then communicated to us a few hours later that he was getting out of the matter and was referring Mr. Westerman to alternative counsel. Oh man, he probably realized the gravity of the situation. All right. Understanding that there are some obvious barriers here, we are attempting to try and convince Mr. Westerman that he should come forward and acknowledge his wrongdoing. It's also worth noting that I, Attorney Rosie, have made arrangements to provide a formal statement to Trooper Ben Rector today, October 12th, at the State Police Post in Peru. Attorney Baldwin has also reached out to Trooper Rector to make arrangements to make a statement regarding the matter. He currently awaits the trooper's return call. I have also disclosed the issue to Mr. Allen himself and communicated various other matters involving the case to Mr. Allen. Mr. Allen communicated to me that he desired that we, Attorney Baldwin and myself, continue with our representation of him. I have included herewith a letter confirming this fact. These are the facts as I understand them at this time. Okay, I'm just checking what you guys are saying here. <laughs> Boyd Nelson says, so great are the Grizzlies worldwide. Jean Davis says, Abby and Libby went out for an innocent walk and met up with evil, and now they can't get the fair justice they deserved. So it's hope. So it's hope. Let's see what happens next, right? Now, two, what occurred here? Our analysis of the situation is that Mitch Westerman committed a crime by exerting unauthorized control over the property of another with the intent to deprive the other person, Andy Baldwin, of any part of its value or use. This is theft. Mr. Westerman's criminal acts were then aggravated by his further distribution of the stolen images. Three, is this a violation of the gag order? The order on judgment of the court gag order dated December 1st of 2022 prohibits the parties from disseminating information or releasing any extrajudicial statements by means of public communication. In this circumstance, Mr. Westerman engaged in the criminal act of theft and thereafter took it upon himself to further distribute the stolen images. At no time did anyone from the defense team ever disseminate information by means of public communication, i.e. the media. In fact, there was never any specific intent on the part of the defense to disseminate the information in any manner. This does not amount to a violation of the gag order. This was filed on October 12th. I think that's what we read at the top there. Four, have the rules of professional conduct been violated? RPC 1.1, 5.1, and 5.3 generally regulate the professional conduct of lawyers. A lawyer must act confidently to safeguard information relating to the representation of a client against inadvertent or unauthorized disclosure by the lawyer or other persons who are participating in representation of the client or who are subject to the lawyer's supervision. Again, in this case, we have an individual who committed a criminal act. As a general rule, our approach of marshalling all of the discovery and exhibits arising therefrom in the back of the Franklin office demonstrates reasonable care. I guess it's arguable that there may be some semblance of negligence to the extent Mr. Westerman was left alone in the back of the office. Either way, I don't see that there is an intentional act that rose to the level of a violation of the rules of professional conduct. We're almost there. Five. I mean, they really addressed it up front. Huh? <laughs> is disqualification appropriate? Our client, Richard Allen, has a Sixth Amendment right to counsel of his choice. If the government moves to disqualify defense counsel, the burden is on the government to show that any infringement on defendant Allen's choice of counsel is justified. At the same time, it has long been recognized that trial courts do have the power to punish misconduct of attorneys and others. To the extent that a court would resort to the extreme remedy of disqualifying a lawyer, nearly all of these circumstances involve the lawyer engaging in some conflict of interest. <laughs> Carla says, I'm about to send a visual chart. We do love a visual chart. And so they say uh, rules 1.7 through 1.1 generally address conflicts of interest. None of these rules are even applicable in the circumstance. 
The rules are designed to provide guidance to lawyers and to provide structure for regulating conduct through disciplinary agencies. The mere fact that a rule is just a basis for a lawyer's self-assessment or for sanctioning a lawyer under the administration of a disciplinary authority does not imply that an adversarial party, the prosecutor, has standing to seek enforcement of the rule. Any violations of the rule should be brought to the attention of the disciplinary committee who would then possess the allegations in the normal course of business. Simply put, the rules are not intended to be used as weapons to seek disqualification for tactical or similar other similar reasons. Six, did the defense team demonstrate candor to the tribunal? The record is clear that the defense team, upon learning of the information, reported this immediately to the court and to the prosecutor. This was done by way of email communications and phone conferences. This conduct is consistent with the lawyer's responsibilities, all of which are referenced in the preamble to the rules of professional conduct. Now, what's interesting is that McClellan said he knew about it 24 to 30 hours before Bradley Rosie even told him about it. I still find that interesting as well. <laughs> Who told him about it? You know what I mean? Okay, so seven, what are the possible sanctions? To the extent there exists some violation of a court order that rises to the level of indirect contempt, an allegation must be brought. None exists in this case because there was no dissemination of the information by means of public communication, which is prohibited by the gag order. At worst, this circumstance amounts to a breach of the defense's duty to main maintain confidentiality of information pursuant to Rule 1.6 and or a breach of the defense's obligation to safe keep property. I mean, I guess, yeah, disciplinary would have made actually, to, in my mind, it seems like a disciplinary would have made sense, but they should have locked it up. I still think, yes, they should have locked it up. And the other problem is that it sounds like Andrew Baldwin was discussing defense strategies <laughs> with his buddy there. Mm -mm, no, no, that's no. Anyway, we believe it's neither as the acts leading to the dissemination of property were not intentional or even reckless. To the extent the prosecutor believes there is wrongdoing on our part, the matter should be raised through the disciplinary process. Eight, what are the practical circumstances created by this issue? First, the only photograph that appears to have been disseminated amongst the public is that of the F tree. Nope, sorry, nope. <laughs> Doesn't seem like it. People are making drawings and paintings and trying to reenact it all based on what they've seen. The ones that say they've seen it, Oh, they're describing it. I don't think it's just the F tree. I hate that it's called the F tree as well. The tree with the supposed F on it. I've seen the picture because it's posted on some people's community posts. I don't know what to say about the F tree. And I hate that it's called the F tree. It sounds weird. Aussie Mel said catching up at 1.5 speed. <laughs> All right. And so they say first, the only photograph that appears to have been disseminated amongst the public is that of the F tree. The photograph in and of itself is not overly gruesome. There's no evidence to suggest that the crime scene photographs of the two girls have been distributed to the general public. To the extent they are distributed, the information has already been consumed by the public as it was specifically detailed in the defendant's, that's true as well, recent Frank's memorandum filed with the court. Moreover, it's also hard to say it's not gruesome because it's the blood of one of the victims. It's gruesome. No one should be seeing that. Okay, moreover, in the natural course of the litigation, there is an, expect an expectation that these images will be displayed in the courtroom at a forthcoming suppression hearing and a trial in this cause. All of these matters are scheduled to occur within the next three months. Naturally, the defense's most significant concern is that the victim's family members not be forced to endure the stress and violation of privacy that would come with a widespread dissemination of this information. Unfortunately, the exposure of these images is imminent, and part of the unfortunate side of the legal process in cases of this nature. The defense has nothing to gain by deliberately disseminating this information to the public. In fact, the opposite is true. The likelihood of public backlash is significant and serves no legitimate purpose to Mr. Allen's defense. Elsor says, I hope they go after all the people that received and shared these photos as well. Right? There's got to be some consequences. Um, so, nine. What are the practical implications of disqualification? As has been previously reported to the court, the discovery in this case involves tens of thousands of tips, hundreds of thousands of pages of documents, thousands upon thousands of hours of video, damn, <laughs> and the engagement of various experts in different disciplines to address a multitude of evidentiary issues. The defense has been working feverishly over the past year to obtain, consume, and understand all of this information. The defense team has engaged in numerous depositions, various pleadings have been filed with the court, 
These pleadings contain work product that has resulted from the thousands of hours spent by the defense team in preparing Mr. Allen's defense. It's entirely impractical to even consider the prospect of disqualifying either one or both of us. It would be nearly impossible for successor attorneys to effectively engage in such a massive endeavor and in familiarizing themselves with the discovery and thereafter adopting the work product and theories of the current defense team and thereafter moving forward with an effective uh, representation of Mr. Allen. Well, that's why they delayed it by a year. The trial is now set for October 15th of 2024. Well, okay, we need to see the forest for the trees here. Sir, it's just not a great metaphor right now. Okay, I object. There's no doubt that the breach of security warranted immediate attention and necessitates some action to try and stop the further dissemination of the materials. <laughs> Good luck once it's out in the public. Ooh, on the internet. Oh, goodness. However, this breach simply does not rise to the level of disqualification, which would naturally unduly delay the administration of justice for Mr. Allen and the victim's families. And 10, context for the court. We're almost there. Again, both Andy and I accept responsibility for this lapse in security. It is, however, important that the court have a better understanding of the totality of sensitive information that is in the hands of the public. We do not view this a tit-for-tat circumstance but I do think the court needs some general understanding of the amount of information that we believe has been previously disseminated by law enforcement officials, which he brought up in that in-chambers meeting as well. Okay. So that was like spoken into the record. <laughs> Here it is as well. Naturally, it is, it's interesting as well, been previously disseminated by law enforcement officials. Like, who the hell are they? Anyway, so naturally it's almost impossible to regulate the disclosure of sensitive information unless there's some direct evidence that is occurring by way of statements to the media, which are then shared with the public. However, in order to bring you some context, I'm asking the court to spend five minutes watching a portion of the video associated with the following link. This link will also be emailed, attached in a separate filing with correspondence, as I don't expect you to be able to access the link in this letter due to formatting issues. Now, I actually haven't looked at that link, hey? <laughs> I haven't looked. But they say, oh, but they tell us what it is, of course, okay? I just haven't taken that, copied and pasted it. Sometimes one is a bit nervous of what are we going to look at? What are we looking at now? All right, and so... <laughs> Gail says, I was wondering what, 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 what... Oh, I keep saying which Mitch looked like. He had some nerve sneaking around like a snake. Shame on Mitch. I know, right? Now we saw his picture. All right, and so... Let's see, I've missed a comment there. Kerry says, you put it brilliantly here. Miku's headphones. Public need to understand that as the one who stole pics studied law, works in a law office, he broke confidence and trampled morally. Yes. And his bond is $1,000? Is that what we saw? And he's got to pay 250 cash? What? That's it? Oh, okay. This is a segment from a court TV broadcast wherein reporter Barbara McDonald communicates with the host information regarding the sticks that were placed near the girl's bodies at the time of the crime. I would encourage you to watch the portion that begins at about the 10-minute mark. Yeah, we looked at this before, guys. And concludes at the 14.30 mark. During this segment, you will see Miss McDonald articulate sources close to the investigation have provided me with drawings of what they say those images look like. She further reports that she has spoken to many investigators who were on the scene at the time who say the assumption was they, the sticks, were randomly placed. She then goes on to share with the host the actual stick formation that she claims were provided to her by, by individuals close to the investigation. I can tell you that these formations are the same formations that were contained in the missing Purdue report that was generated by the state's consultant in Odinism. We recently filed pleadings articulating that this report was handed to us a few weeks back. It seems obvious that portions of the report were shared with the media at some point in the past. Ms. McDonald was also aware that the sticks were not immediately secured as evidence by law enforcement authorities, a fact that could only be learned by reading the incident reports or speaking with investigators. Did you guys know that? That the sticks that were found at the crime scene, or that they described, right, weren't collected initially, apparently, allegedly, as evidence. That's pretty shocking. The point here is, well, we've seen many shocking things. Uh, think of uh, Debbie Collier's case. There's many cases that are like, what happened to that crime scene? All right, so the point here is not to debate the relevance and significance of the stick formation. The point is to demonstrate to the court that there has been throughout this entire investigation 
sensitive information provided by law enforcement investigators to the mainstream media. Frankly, the defense doesn't have the time nor the resources to police these breaches of discovery to the media. I guess my concern, if I was putting myself in their shoes, would be, are we going to blame be blamed for every leak? <laughs> because there's actually been so many. But again, I still say two wrongs don't make a right. This guy was apparently in his conference room, took pictures, broke trust. I still want to know why. Yeah, hope and fear says we're not collected. Mm-hmm. Two weeks later, yes, says, uh, I also heard that, the Pam Pepper. They say it's a, na it's a natural part of the landscape with this high-profile case. We are simply trying to make the point that members of the general public and the mainstream media have their hands on various sensitive materials involved associated with this case and it's virtually impossible to manage the dissemination of this information without incident. Finally, to the extent these photographs are actually published in a widespread manner, this would not in any way prejudice the state's ability to prosecute Mr. Allen, nor prejudice Mr. Allen's ability to defend himself. Again, we are hopeful that this doesn't occur because of the impact on the victim's families, but to the extent it does occur, it would not result in any prejudicial impact to either party. In sum, this is an unfortunate circumstance which does require some remediation to try and preserve the dignity of the victims. It is not a basis to disqualify either Andy and or myself at this juncture in the proceedings. Obviously, to the extent you would like supporting law, I would be more than happy to offer up the same. The intent here is to simply communicate in writing our position with regard to these circumstances to try to bring some context to the situation so that we can engage in some effective mitigation of the breach and move forward with the orderly and efficient disposition of this case in January. Very truly yours, Bradley A. Rosie. It's got such a cool signature. Mine is also like, and a dot. <laughs> he also does a dot here, like a <laughs> Okay, so that was beside the point, I know. So we've looked at all of those documents that I wanted to show you. So now, okay, quickly look at some of your comments and then we're going to call it a night. Ooh, it's almost one in the morning here. Oh dear. <laughs> That's right. Shelly says, I have known about the sticks and an F symbol since February 2017. It was all over social. It was all over Reddit. It was all over everywhere. There's blogs about it. I know, right? There's been people saying they've seen the crime scene photos since 2017. I know I'm aware. That's the thing. But I maintain two wrongs don't make a right, even if... Many people in the public had these photos. For these photos to, well, be leaked, it wasn't, it doesn't sound like the defense leaked it. For this friend to break the trust of Andrew Baldwin, the defense attorney in the highest profile case almost ever, but definitely in Delphi, then that is a problem. You know, that the def that's from the defense's office, this leaked. That is really not good even if the even if everything i mean imagine what else could have leaked oh my word if all the discovery 90 percent of it as bradley rosie says was in there one could almost say thank goodness then only the f tree picture was leaked but i think it was more than that i think there were more pictures clearly you know based on what people are saying unless people are just making it up to be relevant i have no idea Joanna says the crime scene was disrupted and destroyed from the start. I mean, yeah, with all those people searching. It's quite something, huh? There's a lot to think about in this case. <laughs> That's right. Copper Horse says victim blaming or shaming will not be tolerated here. Thank you, Copper Horse, for being here. Okay, so that's what I wanted to show you today. I hope that you saw the beginning of the stream. We were discussing that... The crime scene photo leaker, Mitch Westerman, has been arrested and he was charged with, what is it called? Conversion. And conversion is a person who knowingly or intentionally exerts unauthorized control over property of another person and commits criminal conversion, a class A misdemeanor. I think he's going to be out. He's going to be like in and out because of the low bond amount. You know, I don't think he's going to be in there for long, if I understand correctly. So Alyssa said, so yeah, tell me what you guys think. Alyssa said, I agree. His friend betrayed him. It was in his office. And who's to say that Baldwin was working in the case in his conference room? Not echoed. I mean, the, the problem I have is that Bradley Rosie admits in that document alludes to, well, Andrew Baldwin was sharing 
said that Mitch Westerman was a great strategist and was sharing like defense strategies with him. I mean, that tells you, yeah, he was very comfortable with him. That was his friend. But in a case like this, you can't actually even talk to your friend about it. You know what I mean? Thank you so much. I, mean, I was just about to say goodbye. Thank you so much, everyone, uh, for... <laughs> you, could, you could hear me typing. I was typing to you. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone, for being here with me to discuss these latest developments in this Delphi case. I think it's really sad and unfortunate what's happened in this case from this leak from the defense attorney's office to how Judge Goal handled it and just everything that's transpired. I still am not sure, you know, what what happened to Judge Goal, you know, what her medical emergency was. I'm not sure it's any of our business. If I find out, of course, I'll let you know. But uh, I hope that she does get better soon. Also because the deadline is approaching. November 27th, right? Oh my word, color said second. Images sent. Okay, I'll, I normally just review things before I show things on a live stream. I first got to check it and vet it and do all that. But Carla, I trust you. I know. I know you normally show me good things. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> you send me visuals. This one distributed to this one and then to everyone. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. I'll review all my emails in a moment. I've got like so many that just rolled in. Oh my goodness. And I will see you all again tomorrow for a premiere. Okay, so make sure that you are subscribed. And hit it again or hit the bell or whatever it is on your side, depending on if you've updated your app or not. Make sure your notifications are on. Tomorrow, I'm premiering a Donna Adelson probable cause affidavit read-through with a couple of clips and things. Of course, I'm busy editing that for you. And I will see you then, okay? Interesting. All right, everyone. Stay safe. Happy Thanksgiving. Bye.